Good morning. Welcome back to the D1 Softball Podcast presented by S2 Cognition. I'm Gray Robertson, Tara Henry on the other side of the screen and about 13 hours away by car from where I am, still in Oklahoma City. Tara, we have a national champion. The season is over uh, I, as I shed a tear because I'm going to miss it. College softball has come to a close and the Oklahoma Sooners have done it again. Back to back to back national titles. First of all, how are you? Second of all, how are you feeling now that college softball has finished for the year 2023? Uh, first and foremost, I'm great. Uh, what a season, an incredible season. And I know we're going to talk about this uh, in a little bit, but just an incredible performance by the Sooners. 61 and 1 on the season. Uh, just pure dominance uh, from Oklahoma softball. And wasn't a super easy route. And I think we saw some teams that challenged the Sooners, but all in all, you know, it was a, a tough season for, for them. And Patty spoke about it in the press conference, ton of pressure, but for that squad to be able to do what they did uh, in the manner that they did, just, I don't know that we'll ever see, see another team like this uh, in college softball. And we, there's an interesting discussion to be had about 2022 OU versus 2023 OU. Maybe we'll get into that at some point. Uh, we should note that Alex Storacco is going to join us later on in the program. And Tara, we want this to be a really interactive show because we, we've had a couple nights to, to sit on the, the national championship. We'll talk a little bit about the game, a little bit about the season, but mainly we want to answer your questions out there, dear viewers and listeners. So Tara, what's the best way for people to comment and ask us something. Yeah, good. good. It's Saturday morning uh, still. So good morning, everybody. Uh, good morning to those that are already joining us. But head on over to YouTube, YouTube or Facebook. Easiest way for us to see your questions. Now, we do see your comments, but we would like you to submit questions uh, about the season, about the Women's Cold World Series, about potentially the transfer portal, uh, what we're going to see heading into 2024. Uh, I know it's a little bit early, but uh, we're, we're willing to answer those questions as well. So if you're not on YouTube or Facebook, head on over there so that we can see your questions uh, on our live chat, which we can both see on the right side of our screen. Yeah, we're getting some some great comments already. Good morning as well. Good morning to everybody out there. And Tara, uh, we're going to start this good morning, this good podcast, this final regular season D1 softball podcast, as we always do with the leadoff. Oklahoma, they have won. They sweep Florida State in the Champ Series. They win game two of the Champ Series, three to one. Uh, your winning pitcher, Alex Sirocco, Jordy Ball comes on to get the save. Florida State had a lead after four innings, but then back to back solo home runs by Sidney Sanders and Grace Lyons kind of wiped that away. And then we saw Jordy Ball slam the door. Uh, absolutely. And obviously, it was surprised actually that Sirocco got the start in the circle. We'll talk to her a little bit about that when she joins us on the podcast. But again, we I think the biggest play of the game, and I know everyone's talking about it, is Jada Coleman uh, and her, the robbery of the three run home run. That was really a momentum uh, killer, momentum swing back to, to the Sooners. And I think. Obviously, great performances in the circle from Kat Sandercock. Uh, I think we've got some questions on why we didn't see maybe Kat in, in day one uh, of the series because it is so so difficult uh, to come out of that series with, with dropping game one. But, yes, Jordy Ball. And I know the OU fans have been really chatting about Jordy all season long, and rightfully so. MVP of the tournament and really, really focused in the last month, I would say, month, month or so, it, with the Sooners because again, I know I spoke about this last week, but when I watched her at the first tournament, the Mark Campbell classic, uh, she was not the same Jordy ball. So, uh, but throughout the season, uh, I know that we've seen her grow and again, be the dominant and I'd argue the best pitcher in college softball. Right. Well, we're almost probably she's they're neck and neck with Nyjah Kennedy. I'm, I'm going with both of them. Oh, okay. Good, good, good pick. I'll just take both. I'm just taking both. I want, I've got both on my squad. I mean, are you kidding me? Jordy Ball and Nigel Kennedy? I, I'm not saying no either. So we've got a couple clips, as we always do. And you mentioned the catch by Jada Coleman that took away a three-run homer from Kaylee Harding. Here it is. 
Women's College World, Women's College World Series. Kaylee Harding, deep center field. Back goes Coleman to the wall, and she's got it and keeps it in the yard. The second Rob job of the champ series for these two outfields. <laughs> Jada Coleman is so athletic, and you always see the shot of her catching it and bringing it in. How about the distance she had to cover to even get there? She's running full speed, jumps up to grab this, bring it back in. A payback from yesterday. Kaylee Mudge did this to Oklahoma, and this is so huge for her and her team right now and her pitcher, Alex Duraco. Dang. <laughs> I mean, I have goosebumps still. <laughs> and the, just the the volume of the crowd in that clip. I know I was there and experienced it in person, but just to hear it again, it was so loud at Hall of Fame Stadium. And again, what an incredible play for her to go back, track that, be so uh, cognizant of where she was on the warning track, how close she was to the wall to leap up and make that catch. It's she makes it look really easy, and that play is not easy to do. Yeah, our friend uh, Kinsey Fowler Quinn tweeted out, you know, that was like uh, that was a play that reminded her of somebody who had some volleyball experience in Jada Coleman uh, in kind of typical attack form, uh, and she did play volleyball as well in high school. Um, so, I, I mean, just, again, let your kids play as many sports as possible. I'm just saying. Uh, but Jada Coleman is a freak athlete, and that was a, a freakish <laughs> a freakish play. If Haley Lee got mudged the night before, then Kaylee Harding got jaded in game two. <laughs> I was wondering what you are going to go with. <laughs> yeah, I think we could go that, with that. Jaded. All right. J jaded. Mudged and, mudged and jaded. Yes. Those, those there we go. I'm okay now, with that. Florida State did get on the board. Yes, it wasn't a shutout by the Sooners. And uh, it was somebody who had been struggling in the postseason at the plate pretty much from start to finish. Uh, but her game two swing, Mac Leonard for Florida State, was pretty special. Here's the clip. Leonard pulls that one, and it's gone! Mac Leonard, just her second hit in her last 30 at-bats. Boy, Jess, we were just talking about it. That's a changeup, a 54-mile-an-hour changeup where Mac had been really struggling, and they throw her a pitch that she's able to just barrel up. Just a beautiful job. I mean, talk about the adjustment within this at bat. Look at how out front she is, but still able to get enough to hit this one out. In fact, in this game, she was pulling that same pitch about five feet foul. In this case, gets the Seminoles on the board. That's a heck of a way to break out. Awesome stuff, uh, as I've detailed many times. Uh, Mac Leonard is a friend of mine, and I was really, really proud of her in that moment. You saw her point to the sky. Uh, if you don't know her story, uh, she lost her dad uh, years ago, and uh, she's got his final heartbeat tattooed on her. And uh, I know that that was a, a really cool thing for her to be able to do in the Champ Series. Absolutely. And to get the Seminoles on the board early uh, and – just get some momentum on their side. We'd seen uh, the Sooners dominate. And for Mac to do that, we knew it wasn't going to be enough, but it was the start. And I think, like we said, how pivotal that catch by Jada Coleman was. It's a very different ball game uh, as well if that ball goes over the fence. And with the way that Kat Sandra Cock was pitching, I know she gave up those solo shots, but she really, really was challenging uh, the Oklahoma offense. And, and I think it's a totally different game. But yes, for Mac to to get the Knolls on the board, that was pretty special. And, uh, you know, just driving that change up to right field. And really, you know, there was a there's some whispers in the crowd uh, when that happened. But uh, yes, can't say enough about Florida State and their season uh, and that squad just incredibly fun to watch all year long and uh congratulations to the Knowles to advancing to uh the champ series just a little and, short and you you mentioned the whispers i gotta say like the group text is active everybody's like "Ooh, this is interesting 
You know, we're through four. Florida State's got the one nothing lead. They'll probably need more, but we'll see how Oklahoma can respond. Uh, the response was immediate and emphatic. Sidney Sanders, <laughs> solo home run, and then this from Grace Lyons. One, two to Lyons. Grace sends one deep. Mudge back to the wall and runs out of room. Back to back jacks for OU. And the bottom of the order is crushing it tonight. And you heard Beth Moens talk about it. The bottom of the OU order was yeah. the story in the game. I mean, you look at the the top half. I'll even include Kenzie Hansen. You had Jada Coleman, Tiari Jennings, and Kenzie Hansen go 0 for 9 in this game, and OU still came away with a national championship. That is a testament to lineup depth, and in particular to the bottom of the order just coming through. Yeah, I think in the middle of the game, I was just looking it up. I, I had tweeted that the bottom of the OU lineup, Sanders, Lions, and Boone were four for five with two RBIs and two home runs just after that home run. Like it, it just incredible. There is no let up in that that lineup, one through nine. We've talked about it, but for those three to come through in, in this champ series, it was pivotal for the Sooners, and that shows you how important it is uh, for the bottom of the lineup to be able to turn it over, not even turn it over, just to hit the ball out of the yard. I mean, when, you, when your seven and eight hitters are hitting the ball out of the yard, uh, it's it's a pretty good uh, pretty good lineup uh, to to have to write, I think, every day for, for Batty Gasso. And so the Sooners come away with the national championship back to back to back. They've won the title six times in the last decade. I had a great conversation with Kevin Brown about this yesterday. Like, where does this rank in not just softball runs, but sports runs? And we can talk about UConn women's basketball. I know uh, Alabama football has had some runs. The Patriots, uh, like there, there are discussions to be had here. But when we look at it, when it comes to our sport, Tara, and, and this wonderful sport of softball, it's truly something that we haven't seen. And also, I didn't think we would ever see it in this era of modern softball with so much parody. I mean, that's what's crazy about the sport. Outside of Oklahoma, there's more parody than we've ever seen in college softball. And yet Oklahoma continues to rise above. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Gray. It, it's incredible year in and year out for the Sooners to do what they do. Now, do they pick up some transfers in the offseason historically? Yes, they do. But it's also really difficult not only to win, to be consistent, and to establish a team culture where everyone buys in because – it's not great when you're not playing. There, there are team, there are players on that team that are arguably all Americans, probably on on other squads that aren't aren't being aren't able to play every day. So, it's a team culture facilitating a team culture, uh, getting players to buy into the fact that they're playing for something bigger from the, them themselves. And I think that's what they do so well at Oklahoma. And can't say enough about JT Gasso and, and his job he does with, with the hitters. I just, I don't think he gets enough credit and what they're able to do and how they're able to make adjustments is simply incredible. And, and a lot of that has to do with him. And, and that's the other amazing thing. Another thing I was talking about with Kevin, like it doesn't matter who's up. Oklahoma's going to get the hit. It can be anybody. Again, Sidney Sanders, you look at the batting averages, you know, of the starters in that game. Sidney Sanders had the quote unquote worst, the, the weakest batting average of all the starters. And she was the one that had the game tying home run, uh, the solo shot in the fifth. I mean, OU is going to come through. It will come from someone. We never know who, but somebody is going to get the hit and everybody is a candidate. Oh, absolutely. And that's, again, what makes them so tough. Look at, I mean, Gray, I don't know if you've had a chance to look at all these questions, but we've got some questions over here oh, yeah. um, in the chat if we want to jump to those while we wait for Alex to join well, us. Because I love this players. one. Uh, what was your favorite food stand at the WCWS this year? Calf fries? <laughs> <laughs> Never again. No. No, uh, I got addicted to the tea. I, I was having tea every single day. I think it was my uh, my pick me up every day when I needed a little jolt of caffeine. And that line was super long. I don't know if, if you all were there and had a chance to have a tea. But every day I had uh, peach on the beach uh, for me. Keep, keep me going. Yeah, I'm going to be honest. Uh, game times for Alabama while I was there were not super conducive to going around and eating <laughs> stuff. 
and uh, lo- love the team I cover. We weren't there long enough for me to get to get a lot of food experience this time around. So maybe next year. I, I do like this question. It's not even necessarily about the champ series, but we can discuss it while we wait for Alex. Uh, this is from John Gray and Tara should college softball move its season back a week and a half. So we can have ABC all to ourselves and not compete with the NBA and NHL. Uh, a couple things here. One ratings were great. Again, who's surprised. Uh, and it was really good to see the ABC time slots cash in. It was really good to see a, a quality game on ABC. Shout out to Oklahoma and Stanford, or I should say Stanford and Washington. Yeah. When that was actually a competitive, interesting game. I know that there are a lot of coaches who want to move the college softball season back anyway, just because of weather in, in particular, uh, Larissa Anderson has been on that train over at Missouri for a couple of years now. So if that is something that happens, uh, it would be probably because of that, because of the weather that impacts the majority of the country in February. And uh, having ABC all to softball would uh, would be a nice little bonus. Oh, yeah, it would be a great bonus. And I know a lot of the Big Ten coaches are absolutely for moving uh the season back just and even a week uh, i think we're looking at something that that really benefits everybody on both ends i don't know that how that even starts or where that goes but it is a rules change year and i know we had a rules change question uh yes. here somewhere on uh the chat which i think gray you can pick up if possible yeah i can flash that as well uh this is from robin what rules do you see being changed before next season i know that uh a lot of people want to talk about obstruction. Where's Jen? Is she here? Did we? <laughs> did she pop up if we say the word obstruction? Right. I think um, they're looking at changing the actual definition of obstruction. Uh, a questionnaire was sent out to the coaches on a, a bunch of the rules to go over. So what they want to do is change the obstruction to a defensive player cannot block any part of the base without the ball in their possession. Uh, defensive players must catch the ball first before they can be positioned in front of the base. So the current rule uh, that's written is a defensive player cannot block the whole base or plate. Um, this is very subjective to the umpire that uh, is um, umpiring that game. So making it vary from play to play. So I think this actual language would clear that up. So I think they are going to be looking at obstruction, Gray. Okay, that's... I'm for it. Uh, I think that I think that that's one of many things that we need to get looked at. Uh, I would love for there to be some discussion about illegal pitches and just what constitutes it being called and what constitutes it not being called. That's not a commentary on Jordy Ball. That's a commentary on the amount of times that I see see it called like ten times in a game, and then the same pitcher not be called at all. <laughs> and in particular, I you know Emma Limley dealt with that a lot last year. Uh, McKenna Reed all of a sudden is illegal in the World Series when I'm not sure if she was called for an illegal pitch in the regular season, not in the games that I saw. So we've just we've got to get more clarity there. And, uh, you know, the out of the box rule is um, I have thoughts. <laughs> Tara, well, what you do you know, think? I mean, you know, I have thoughts on the out of the box rule. Uh, yeah, that is another rule that is going to be looked at. So it will be required. I think they're going to go looking at back the entire foot to be out of the batter's box. Uh, and the bat ball contact for the batter to be declared out. So uh, it'll allow the umpire to focus on the strike zone because we don't always have four umpires uh, in every single uh, game in division one. And I think they're looking at going to see the entire foot out of the box rather than just any part of the foot out of the box. So another rule that we'll take a look at pace of play. uh, They could eventually Mm. talk about pace of play. Uh, I know they talk a lot about it uh, on the broadcast. Uh, I know Beth Mo- Beth Mowens and uh, all the rest of the crew, they, they talk every day about pace of play. But uh, considering ke- making sure that a batter keeps her foot in the box, think about it, Gray. You know, that's 10, 15 seconds when a batter walks up and down the line to take the practice swings, get a you know sign from the coach, uh, and then potentially a pitch clock, what they've done in, in baseball. And I think there was a huge pushback in terms of having a pitch pop clock in baseball. And now – they're all used to it uh, and they quite like it. So I think that could potentially be looked at as well. Hmm. I'm looking at more questions. There are a couple that I want to get to after we have Alex on because they're longer discussions. Uh, I like this one from our buddy Braden. 
who reminded me of the cow fries. Thank you, Braden. Uh, do you have a favorite moment from the WC WS Tara? I'll, I'll let you uh, take this first. Oh, favorite moment. Um, gosh, that's such a good question. There were so many great moments throughout the series, but I know this is kind of a, a different one, but when Montana Fouts and Nyjah Kennedy were in the line, and I know I spoke about this, Gray, uh, and they were shaking hands. It was Montana Fouts' last game uh, and Nyjah's first game uh, on the scene in the Women's College World Series. I just got quite emotional about it and um, thought that was just a really cool moment. Just we're continuing to see uh, new stars pop up on the scene and to – send Montana Fouts uh, out of, you know, Division One softball for her to play her last game in Oklahoma City. I thought that was really, really special. And there's been chatter, and I know you've heard a ton of it being a part of the Alabama radio crew, but um, it was very fitting. And to me, probably the best moment of the Women's College World Series. Yeah, if you go and look, there are a lot of similarities between <laughs> Nyjah Kennedy's 2023 World Series, her first trip, and Montana Fouts' first trip in 2019, like opponents and way games played out. It's it's kind of eerie how similar uh, those paths were. And I think that we did kind of see a passing of the torch in that moment. And uh, Nyjah Kennedy seems primed to be the next great face of softball. And her star is only going to rise after the performance in the World Series. For some reason, I keep thinking of Josie Muffley, you know, I keep thinking of all the plays that she made in the field. I keep thinking of the hits that she had. And uh, Josie Muffley, I feel like, um, really shined in a lot of moments. Uh, also, I'm going to be honest, uh, a big one that sticks out in my head was against Kennedy, T.R. Jennings. Finally getting the hit after uh, Kennedy had owned her pretty much in the entire time that they had been facing off. Uh, in the two games that OU and Stanford had played, but finally getting the hit. Uh, I really think that pitching coaches need to work on their O2 pitch calls against Oklahoma. We've seen a couple of issues with that uh, this postseason. But Tiari Jennings, you know, even though this World Series wasn't amazing for her, I mean, she just hit 222 in, in the entire event. One of those hits came in such a clutch situation for the team, but also for her to snag the RBI record in OKC. Oh, absolutely. Sorry. I, I told um, Alex uh, 1215 and didn't put the Eastern time. So I'm just trying to <laughs> just trying to make sure we can get Alex to jump on here. Totally my bad, everybody. Um, <laughs> yes. Uh, snagging uh, the, the RBI record. And again, I think there were so many great moments, Gray. And that's what makes the Women's College World Series so special. Utah being back or being back for the first time uh, under Amy Hogue since 94. That was a story. Stanford obviously coming back with Alistair since first time she played uh, with the Cardinal uh, back in uh, 2005, 2006, whatever it was. There was just so many storylines and what makes the Women's College World Series great. Yeah, I, I mean, this event is second to none. Uh, there are so Alex is coming. She's yeah, I just checked okay. on it. Yeah, she's okay. she's jumping on. It's totally my fault, everybody. All is well. <laughs> All is well. Um, I, I've seen a couple of illegal pitch comments in there. I didn't want to open a can of worms when I was talking about illegal pitches. I just think that we need to get you more uniformity in how it's called and what is called. Uh, and the consistency with which it is called. That's all I ask. I'm not picking on anybody. I just, as somebody who calls a lot of games, I see different umpiring crews, honestly, be more, I guess, more emphatic about illegal pitches calls. And, and we didn't see it, I don't think, in the World Series, but it, it is something that happens. I know multiple umpires that I'm thinking in my head who are known for calling leaving early way more than any other crew. And, and I think we just need more uniformity in that regard uh, because sometimes it feels a little pick and choosy. Yeah. And, you know, when we're talking about illegal pitches, we'll go back to that. It, it This whole issue has been solved in the international game in which I urge you all to support the international game first and foremost, but um, it's completely uh, taken care of because they just take that, that role out of it. So um, it would allow umpires to be freed up uh, this is my stance. Now everybody doesn't have to agree with it. Uh, and I think that if you just take that rule out of their hands, then 
you know, there's no issue with it. Now, do people that are purists want to have that? I don't think so, but we're doing it on the international side already. So I just don't see uh, the issue there and just let the kids throw. Um, not sure it makes that, that big of a difference. And um, I think calling, calling a kid for illegal pitches d does make a huge difference in the game. Uh, you can agree or you can not agree. That's just my personal opinion. Matt has a question. Do you think UCLA will make it back to the Women's College World Series in 2024? Tara? Ooh, that's a good question. Uh, I, I think we're going to have to see where the Bruins go to get some arms in the transfer portal. I know they got a big recruit coming in, but uh, I think pitching is going to be key for the Bruins. Obviously, the, the bats went cold, I think, at the end of the season. Plenty of bats, uh, plenty of offense, but, you know, losing uh, – Megan Framo, uh, Brooke Yanez in the circle is going to be really tough to to replace. But we saw freshman pitchers uh, come in and, and make a huge splash this year. So uh could definitely happen. Uh, right now, I, I think we got to wait until we see what kind of pitching they've got. I'm, I'm not going to make a, a prediction until we get through uh, the summer here. Yeah, you know UCLA is going to make some moves, portaling. But there are a lot of people gone. Yeah, we, we didn't mention Aaliyah Jordan, whose career has – I don't want to say finally, but finally come to an end after seven years of playing college softball. And so that'll be a big bat that they have to replace. And they have a lot of talented freshmen as well. Uh, Megan Grant was like the whole offense for them in regionals. <laughs> so she'll be uh, very important in her sophomore season. Okay. Thank you for the questions. We'll get to more. Don't worry, but it's time to get to our cleanup hitter who is stepping in now. Alex Taraco, what's up? Hello. How are you? Congratulations on your uh, national championship. Thank you so much, you guys. I mean, it's just been an absolute whirlwind the past couple of days. So still getting my voice back, still trying to unpack and sort some things out. So, yeah. Yeah, Alex, I'm going to apologize. It's totally my fault, everybody, because I told her an hour later. So everybody <laughs> just going to apologize to Alex publicly. It's totally my fault. But um, Alex was there on the field with you after winning a national championship. I know we talked about it, but now that you've had some time to kind of sit back and reflect on the season, uh, what are you feeling right now? Uh, just just a couple days removed from winning a national championship. I feel like it still hasn't set in and I feel like, you know, it won't for a while, to be honest. Um, and it's funny because everyone's like, oh my gosh, it should. Like you were the starting pitcher of that game. Like what was that like? And I was like, I don't know. I, I just think I was just trying to just be so like cool, calm and collected that like I'm still in that mindset of like, okay, yeah, yeah, super casual, right? And it's so cool too, because I feel like it's a feeling that you don't know and can never describe until you actually feel it. Because I mean, I was around, you know, Kinsey Hanson, Tiari Jennings, Jada Coleman. I mean, Nicole May, they talk about winning. I mean, like it's nothing. And, you know, when I was like, okay, like, well, what's it like? What's it like? They're like, oh, you'll just like, you'll have to figure it out. You'll have to figure it out like all year. Um, and it's crazy too, because a year ago today, 365 days ago, I landed for my visit in Norman. And the first thing that me and my parents did was go see Marita Hines Field. And they were, it was like 10 30 in the morning, and they were already putting 2022 up on like their like national championship, like stand outside the field. And we were like, oh my gosh, didn't they just win the previous night before? <laughs> and so, like, seeing how fast they got that up, my parents yesterday were like, oh my gosh, let's get to the field. Let's see if they already have 2023 up. And sure enough, they did. It was like, 12 30 and, and so we were like wow like it's just crazy like how fast like they put it out there but also it's just so cool to be like on the other end now on the <clears throat> finally on the inside of it all knowing what goes into that process of you know winning a national championship um and being a part of it and it's just like you do have to like to take that time to really like kind of calm down from all of it and, and really just let it settle in because I feel like it still hasn't done that yet Alex, I remember that we were having conversations last summer when you were in the FGCL about your visit to Oklahoma, about how excited you were to go to Norman. Now that you have a ring, now that the season is over, and now that your college career is over, when you look back, what does the reality of the experience, how, how does it compare to what you were imagining going in? 
I didn't really know what I was like imagining, I guess. And it's just, um, I don't know. Afterwards, I felt like, you know, throughout the Women's College World Series, the, we would win one. And we're like, okay, like, who's next? Like, what's what's next? Who do we pray for next? Like, all this stuff. So, like, you never got too high. You never got too low. And so, like, after we beat Florida State for the second time, I was like, okay, like, what's next? And they were like, no, no, like, that's it. We won. Like, you know, we get our trophies now. And, you know, we celebrate and all this stuff. And I was like, okay, cool. Like, what's after that? <laughs> like, you're just so in, like, such a game mode all season. And I feel like we really did take like one game at a time. And so like when it was like all said and done, I was like, wow, that's it. Like that's, that's what we worked for. And so like, it's, it's kind of funny cause you don't know that feeling until like you really do experience it. Um, and Jada was a big voice all season um, <clears throat> ever since last year's trophy of just, she's like, I kind of felt empty after last year of like, you worked so hard to get to something. Um, and then, like, when it's all said and done, you don't really know how to feel. And I got that for, like, a split second for sure. And it was just like, okay, like, like all this work is done. But I feel like it's also on another level of <clears throat> I'm done with college softball. <clears throat> Sorry. And so, like, that was kind of really surreal um, for me. Um, me and my dad, like, had a moment of just, like, a really long embrace of just like so many hours on like of him catching me on a bucket um and just like that extra time to ourselves that we got and we bonded with growing up and like all of that like I would sit like inches from the tv watching you know the women's college world series growing up and so seeing all of that being a part of it now it's like it was such a dream come true and it was funny because I feel like my dad never really gets emotional. So he said that like every game of the women's college road series, this year, he like cried in the national like, <laughs> the, the anthem and everything, which is so funny. And I knew I was starting like hours before, obviously. And usually like I would kind of give him a heads up of like who was throwing every game pretty much even throughout the season. And um, I didn't tell anyone that I was starting on um, for the national championship. And, so I didn't realize this until like afterwards, but my dad was like, oh my gosh, I just, I just froze and sat there when like I found out that you were starting and I was just started crying and I was like, oh my gosh, like we were the visiting team. So I didn't even like throw instantly. Like you had to like sit in your tears for a little bit, <laughs> but it was actually so fun to listen to just everyone, um, like their reactions to everything. It was really special for like my entire family, like all my siblings to be in town and um, aunts and uncles. I have a, a younger um, cousin who's just getting into softball and all that world too. So it's just, it's so cool to see, you know, that kind of support and you know where softball is now today. And Alex, it's a tradition to uh, go and celebrate uh, at Toby Keith and there was a, a few videos uh, swarming around Twitter. What was that like to go back and be <clears throat> kind of hanging out with Toby Keith and singing with Toby Keith after winning a national championship? I mean, my parents were like, oh yeah, I like Toby Keith here. And I'm like, since when did you become friends with Toby Keith? They're like, well, you know, the parents <laughs> section all week. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> Casual. My mom's like, here, I'll come take you to meet him. And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> so, like, it was so funny. It was so cool to have Toby Keith there, like, in the parent section. And then for him to be there at our celebration, um, he was just so excited. He told us that he had bought, like, um, horses and to get them trained for horse races and all that stuff. And he was like, I named, I left one nameless and everything. Um, and so he was like, I was either going to name her six Natty Patty or seven Natty Patty. And I don't name her seven Natty Patty. And it was so cool. Coach was just like, oh my goodness. And so like, just to be up there and we were um, singing with him and just to see like him going through his, um, his health and everything. And you know, just to see how like joyful he was to celebrate with us was really, really cool. Um, and it was funny too, because I remember, I think it was like my 12 year, 14 year year. It was like a Christmas party and we were, you know, just hanging out with parents and all that stuff. And Toby Keith Red Solo Cup was on. And I just remember like being 12 and like just singing at the top of my lungs. So like after a national championship and I'm, I'm singing Who's Your Daddy? And um <laughs> How do you like me now? I was like, this is amazing. Are we kidding? Like, this is so cool. And uh, it was it was so much fun. I had a blast. And just to see, like, 
I don't know. Everyone just like coach said it in a presser afterwards and just like it's freeing afterwards and all that stuff. And we've played with so much pressure this season from every kind of angle and just to see how much fun we were able to have that we accomplished every goal and, you know, checked everything off of our list. It was really, really special. I love that full circle, (laughs) if you will, the Toby (laughs) Keith of it all. I I wanted to talk about this, this pitching staff in general with you and Jordy ball and Nicole may that's three really powerful arms and y'all found a way to make it work. You found a way to gel. Everybody got theirs and everybody really thrived this year. How did that dynamic work and become so successful all season long? I, like we worked so well, like kind of instantly, honestly. And like everyone talks about me, Jordy, Nicole, but a lot of people forget that you know you have Kirsten, Kirsten Deal, who and SJ Guren, who are on the backside. And Katie, she is amazing. She is like the sassiest just attitude, like le- like so lively with everything that she says. And so for her to take this season and be able to learn from each and every one of us. I think that also just builds to the growth of this program that we are developing, you know, people um, on the underclassmen side of things. And for her to take it like a champ and come in at the end of the year and some really big moments for her, I was so excited for her. And it was so cool to see everyone just like be so excited for each other. I mean, I, I had a smile on my face when I knew Jordy was going in uh, game two like I knew I was like oh Jordy's got it like and she was so excited for me when I got the start so like when you have those moments and even with Nicole I mean you you're in film together for so long preparing for games and throughout innings of a game even if it's a tough one um you're like hey like what are you seeing or where was that pitch in a replay like where did where where was it in regards to our location and stuff so when you're out on the mound and you don't just feel like it's you against the hitter. You feel like there's so much more um, compact into that pitching circle. Like there's so, there's so much that goes into it. And when you're able to bond like that, um, it's so special, I think too, because I mean, there's so many inside jokes. There's so many like little tidbits that you would think and just personality growth throughout the year too. I mean, you just, you get to know a different side of each other, not only as pitchers, because we all have very different personalities as pitchers. I mean, Nicole May can be one of, I think the only people that can be so like ice cold on the mound. And then she gets in the dugout and she's next to me dancing. I mean, it's so (laughs) unreal. I got to love her today. And just so to see, like, you don't have to be, you know, a, a robot to win all these national championships. They just have so much fun and giving their all and everything that they're doing. And I think that is what, you know, is so special about, you know, this pitching staff and the way Coach Rocha is with us. Um, I said it in a presser at the beginning, like she's an absolute mother to us and she laughs at all of our jokes and she is right there with us and she's there when we're crying and she's there when we're happy. And when you have that kind of support, um, it truly is a family within a family. Well, we're not going to keep you too much longer so you can get your voice back. But last one for me, um, Alex, I know there's been a lot of chatter about transfer portal and transfers and transferring from one school to the next. And everyone has their own opinion. But I just want to get your perspective on on how this experience and what it's meant to you, because I know there's probably some players out there that are, that are maybe thinking about it or not wanting to do it. But I just want you to share your experience and why um, it's been so great for you. Absolutely. Um I know there's so many different versions of the transfer portal and you know so many updates and I'm sure there'll be rules soon, honestly, with the kind of backlash I feel like that it's gotten. Um, and I feel like this year's portal is a lot different than last year's portal too. Um, there's so many verities between all of it. Um, I mean, in my own situation, I was very proud of the fact that I, you know, gave my four years that I promised and I got my degree. I'm very proud of my degree from Michigan. Um, And it was just time for me to, you know, go to another school and experience something more. And um, I'm very, very, very thankful for every part of that journey. Um, And, you know, I I got accepted to other places as well and in school as well as Michigan. So being able to even broaden my perspective in a classroom aspect as well was very, very big for me as well. And that's very important to me. Um, That's why I picked Michigan in first place academics um, was a big thing for me. Um, but in the softball regard too, you have to understand that there's in this new generation of players, 
sometimes you just don't blend and there's, you know, there's some people that I feel like are, that can get into like a power struggle when it gets to like either coaching and all that stuff and recruiting, whether from the portal or whether you're in high school and in high school recruiting is like, I feel like it can be a headache and a whirlwind and everything in between. And you don't know what you're really getting from the front. And so when you finally in it, and no one can understand the trenches of D1 softball until you're really in it. Um, and if it's not for you, and if sometimes there's just teammates or sometimes it's a coach or sometimes it's how far you are from home or how far you're not from home and stuff. I think there's so many aspects that go into transferring. It's not just about the trophies, the ring chasing, the academics or anything like that. Everyone is so different. And I think, that's why I get personally so upset when people bring up the portal because you never know someone's situation, whether that's softball wise or just personally. I mean, you don't know what people are going through. And that's why I'm also a huge advocate for mental health. So mental health means so much to me. And sometimes mental health is a really big aspect for the portal. Um, and before I think Coach Castle even knew I was a big advocate for mental health. Like one of the big things is like a psychology, like a psychological resource office here for athletes. And I think that is absolutely amazing. And I think that um, it's going to be a big front here in the next couple of years within NCAA sports because of how much social media is growing into sports and everything and how college sports are just picking up. I mean, you just kind of hear softball getting like, I think all the attention in the world. And I think that's so exciting, but people forget, you know, within even in the NIL days we don't we're not getting paid for this we're not you know doing the little things that you might think so and so we're still 18 to 23 year olds that are putting you know mind body and soul into everything that we do because it's a sport that we fell in love with a long time ago but sometimes you forget about that love while you're in the trenches of you know the NCAA so um a lot of people or on the couch tweeting about it, but like you don't really know until you're in the grind. So I think the portal can be amazing. Um, and, you know, I think that goes to show too, like how you're recruiting. If you have a lot of kids leaving your team, maybe not point fingers at them, but maybe what's going on within that program that's happening too. And I know that there's, it fluctuates obviously year to year, but every team is different year to year. Um, no one thought that we would be good after losing, you know, Jocelyn Allo. And we put together, you know, one of the best teams ever. So I think there's so many different aspects that go into the portal that everyone's so quick to judge everything. So um, you just have to like kind of keep that in mind that we're people too before we're athletes. I love that. Uh, that's awesome. A great message from Alex Taraco here on the D1 Softball Podcast. Alex, last thing, and then we'll let you go. Kind of a one part question, one part statement. One, now that season's over, how many Mega Stuff Oreos did you eat in celebration? A and two, let everybody know how they can keep up with you beyond college softball. What's next? Um, well, let's see. I have not had any mega stuffed Oreos because I haven't been home to buy any. And like, I don't think Coach Gasso would approve of me getting mega stuffed Oreos on the road. So I haven't had any, but it's like number one on my grocery list. You have no idea. And I know you know. You have an idea, Gray. I know. I have I have some in the uh, the pantry right now. Oh, actually. absolutely. And you know how many people I have like absolutely put on to mega stuffed Oreos? They're like, we can't go back to regular Oreos. And I was like, I'm telling you this whole time. <laughs> <laughs> and what's next for me, I'm, you know, just trying to figure out some uh, pro deals and everything. So trying to, you know, kind of figure out what's best for me and my in my opportunity. I know I got drafted to both WPF and AU. So just trying to, you know, make a pros and cons list kind of in the same aspect of kind of how I was in the portal too. just trying to make sure that, you know, a lot of my boxes are crossed. I know AU um, it's at home for me, which is a really big thing, too. And then OKC um spark um is right around the corner so um there's so many pros and cons to everything um i'm so excited for what's next i know it's coming up very soon so trying to figure out all the logistics but um yeah it should hopefully be figured out in the next couple days um but i am very excited to see where softball takes me for sure Awesome. Well, Alex, thank you so much for, for joining us here on the D1 Softball Podcast. I know uh, we've appreciated all that you've done with D1 this year. And congratulations on a phenomenal college career and ending it with a national championship. Thank you so much.
Thanks, Alex. Alex Taraco, the winning pitcher in game two of the national championship series to secure the national championship. I mean, I, I love I love everything she said. Uh, Alex is such a cool person. I'm really glad I got to know her this past summer and watching her journey all year long uh, has been just so, so special. And, and it was really good, uh, really good to see her be able to have that moment in the champ series. Yeah. And, you know, I wasn't quite sure that Alex was going to get the start. And so when we saw that her name uh, come up on the stat cast, I, I was pleasantly surprised. I thought that Patty was going to go to May. And I think that was huge for her to get that start and come through uh, with the win for the Sooners. And just what an experience from going to Michigan uh, to her dream was to win a national championship and for her to be a part of that and not only be a part of it, but to throw uh, in the championship game. Uh, incredible. So there were a couple more questions I want to make sure that we uh, we got to. <laughs> um, <laughs> Braden, oh no, Braden, no. We need a live and PGA combining of the WPF and AU. I am not talking about live golf on this podcast. Absolutely not. <laughs> I. <laughs> Ooh, those are fighting words for Gray. I, but I agree. We do need a like either it needs to be combined or my my thoughts because I know Gray. We don't want to get Gray on on live right now. Everybody. Um, I think I will walk out of the studio. I, know. I think what needs to happen is I think AU would be great if we could use AU as spring training or AU as um kind of a warm up into WPF. So I think if both could just live happily together, that would be fantastic and get on the same page. So players could play both. Um, because right now when you have two competing leagues, it's really difficult. And you heard Alex talk about it. She doesn't know what she's going to do. And making players choose between the two, I'm not a huge fan of it. But hopefully we can get both sides to to get along and, and, and play nicely here in the next couple of years. All right, a couple more that I wanted to get to from the sports scene with the Wood Brothers. Looking forward to next year, who are the top three programs to challenge Oklahoma? Uh, we were talking about UCLA early on. Uh, as the roster stands right now, I don't know. But, again, they can get portal people. I, I think that a lot has to be made of Tennessee basically only losing Ashley Rogers. They're bringing back a lot of people next year. Uh, Oklahoma State will, again, be a team that we have to keep an eye on. Uh, Florida State, we'll see how they replace Cat Sandercock and whether they heavily attack the portal as well this offseason. And I, I think that if Stanford can, you know, up the offense a little bit with Kennedy and Vodder, that is a team primed to make a run, a very legit run for a national championship next year. Did you say Clemson, Gray? Did I did not say Clemson. Oh, I, I think you Clemson. Say Clemson. Yeah. I'm I'm saying Clemson. <laughs> um, I think Clemson just yeah, we saw how tough they played OU in the Super Regional, and you'd argue that Clemson could have could have would have should have been in the Women's College World Series. Uh, I think if they don't draw OU as a Super, I think they they give anybody else a run for their money. So uh, I'm all about Clemson jumping in on that mix. Yeah, and you know. Another reason this is all kind of a moot point a little bit is a little bit of a testament to Melissa's question here. Who do you think will transfer from Oklahoma? So many great players that don't get to play as much as they would somewhere else. Alex just talked about it. The The portal is the biggest wild card. I, I could argue in sports, like it can change anything at any time and their reasons and their reasons are none of our dadgum business, but I think when it comes to the portal, expect the unexpected. So all these packets I've got of roster breakdowns and what next year is going to look like, I could almost throw them on the grill outside because there are so many things that are going to change by the time February rolls around. Yeah. And I think next week's going to be a pretty big week for the transfer portal. So um, I'd keep your eyes out for on the D1 softball transfer tracker. I think we're going to, we're going to see some interesting names enter the portal here. Um, that's all I'm going to say, Gray couldn't agree more uh again expect the unexpected I i'm looking to see any other questions i had to scroll all the way up to get back to that one so ooh, <laughs> i like this one uh what matchups are y'all looking forward to in the tax act clearwater invitational presented by evo shield did i do it right 
I, for, I think uh, so. Okay, like, February twenty fourth. I need to know where those matchups are. I, I get it. <laughs> we we won't have the schedule for a while, but we do know the teams that will be in it. And uh, if my memory serves, I'll pull it up now. I think Stanford's going next year. A, a team that we were just talking about. Incredible. I think that will be huge for the Cardinal to go out and play in Clearwater. It's that first kind of tournament where it's got a postseason feel in February. So heading out to Clearwater and then the Mary Nutter uh, just that next weekend. So I can't believe we're already talking about those two. But um, yes, uh, excited for both those those matchups for uh, if Card- if the Cardinal are going out to Clearwater, I think that'd be a good test for them. All right, I'll ask you a, a different question after I read the teams going to Clearwater. Florida State, Georgia, Georgia Tech, Kentucky, LSU, Minnesota, North Carolina. They'll have a new head coach. Uh, Northwestern, Oklahoma State, Stanford, Tennessee, Texas, UCF, UCLA, Washington, Wisconsin. So we know that typically – the Tax Act Clearwater Invitational presented by Evo Shield wraps up with Florida State versus fill in the blank in prime time. Which team would you like to see in that primetime game against Florida State to wrap up the event? Oh my goodness, that's such a great question. But I think we're going to have to go with Stanford. I think everybody wants to see Nigel Kennedy in the circle. So I would love to see a Stanford there in that time slot, potentially a Tennessee. Uh, as well, I, I think that would be great. But uh, I, I'm going with Stanford. I, Oklahoma State could be fun. Yeah. But uh, let's see. Oh, now they're saying what matchups you want to see at the Nutter. That's too much, y'all. We we gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> we gotta go. Uh, Tara, any any final thoughts before we say our farewells? <laughs> Uh, no, I just want to thank everybody who's joined us every week and been so active in the chat. And um, it, we wouldn't be able to do what we do if it wasn't for you all. And I hope that we provide you with the content and the chatter and the interviews that um, you all like. And uh, just honestly, I'm so thankful for this job and, and to be able to talk about softball and be able to sit here with Gray Robertson, who every week just holds it together. Can't say enough about my partner and just wouldn't be able to do all these things if uh, you weren't on the other, other end of this. So appreciate you, Gray, and appreciate all of you for watching uh, each and every week. I am, I am thankful for this sport, this dadgum, amazing, beautiful, hectic, crazy, frustrating, wild, wonderful sport of softball. And I think that uh, this podcast has been, Really, really phenomenal because I've gotten a chance to work with my friend, my podcast partner, Tara Henry. Uh, We've gotten the opportunity to chat with people coast to coast. I mean, from Kat Sandercock to Coach Ford at Fullerton. Like, we we have covered everything uh, in between this year, and and it's been really special. It's been special to interact with with so many wonderful people who have a lot of uh, questions and sometimes comments out there on the (laughs) socials. And no matter how we joke or, or what we say, we definitely appreciate all of the interaction. Uh, also, last but not least, a ton of credit to Kelly Higby, the magician behind the scenes who makes it happen every time we're out here. Kelly, uh, who is getting married very soon. Best of luck there. Uh, and congratulations on your pending nuptials. And thank you for uh, all of the work that you did on the pod this year. Tara, thank you for bringing me on. It was a blessing. And uh, now we get to sleep for like two days before I go to do summer softball. Oh, I love it. It's crazy doing summer softball, doing some international stuff. But we'll drop our, our final top 25 uh, on Monday. And we'll have our D100 players, so top 100 players uh, of the season as well. We've got some fun content that will be uh, released next week and some player awards. So we still have stuff for you all. But um, again, thank you all for joining. Absolutely. For uh, for my partner, Tara Henry, for Kelly Higby, and for Alex Sirocco. Thank you, Alex, for hopping on this edition of the D1 Softball Podcast. Uh, I'm Gray Robertson. Thank you to S2 Cognition as well for being a great presenting sponsor all year long. And remember, you can check out all of that wonderful content on d1softball.com with the promo code podcast 20. Thank you for a great year. We'll see you in 2024 and probably a little bit before then. That's all for the D1 Softball Podcast. We'll see you next time.